Okay, here we go. All right, this is Richard Solomon. Greetings from Book Expo America 2010. And I am with Catherine Phillips Singer. And I am with Sid Phillips. Now, these are quite amazing Americans. And I think it's important that amazing Americans have contributed to our history and our future uh, need to be exemplified. So uh, let me first talk to uh, Mr. Phillips here. Uh, I understand you're the author of a book called Sorry. You'll be sorry. You'll be Richard. sorry. You'll be sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be sorry. Oh, my God. It's like street fighting. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me about your book and, and your, of course, your Im- very important uh, service to our country. When you are sent to Paris Island for boot camp, you arrive with long hair and a little suitcase and all the men that are there that are not in formation, when they walk by, they scream, you'll be sorry. <laughs> so that becomes uh, part of, of the Marine Corps. And every Marine knows what you'll be sorry stands for. And that's why I chose that title for my book. Okay. Now, y- you were in World War II. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about your uh, enlistment or draft into the service and what followed from there. I was 17 years old, and on Sunday when the Pearl Harbor attack occurred, my closest friend was right there with me. Uh, Well, maybe not my closest friend, but one of my close friends. And he said, let's go join the Navy tomorrow. So uh, I said, okay. So the next morning, we went down to the recruiting station. All the recruiting stations were in one building. And... uh, the line for the Navy was about 300 yards long. So we walked up to the head of the line just to see what was going on. And this Marine recruiting sergeant from the office next door to the Navy, there wasn't any crowd in his office. He came over and said, uh, you boys want to kill Japs? And we said, yeah, that's right. And uh, But we're going to join the Navy. And he said, no. He said, you can't get in the Navy. Your parents are married. Come in here and let me talk to you. So uh, we went in and talked to him, and we ended up joining the Marines. So that was your first um, introduction to heavy marketing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> see, see, marketing is not just for toothpaste and peanut butter. <laughs> but we weren't very smart. <laughs> okay. So, so you, you gave up the opportunity for Navy Chow. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I guess in a, in a bunk. <laughs> and, and so where did they send your did – you, did you, oh, how, how long was it before – that transaction and your actual, you know, uh, being put on, getting your head shaved and putting on a uniform? It was about 10 days. Uh, we arrived in Paris Island, I think, the 29th of December, 41. And uh, they immediately uh, cut boot camp from 12 weeks to six weeks. Because of so, the urgency? Because of the urgency. We were out of there in six weeks. Good. Now, where were you living before you enlisted? I was living in my hometown, Mobile, Alabama. Okay. And uh, and you enlisted in Mobile, Alabama? Correct. But they swore you in in Birmingham. Okay. So then, okay, so now you're in Paris Island. You, you're now hazed and you're told that you'll be sorry. Correct. You got it. <laughs> okay. So is it all like downhill from there? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, okay, so after your six weeks, what happened next? They sent us to uh, New River, North Carolina, which later became known as uh, Camp Lejeune. Okay. We went through infantry training, and uh, then the uh, first week in June, I think it was, we were shipped out uh, by troop train across the U.S. Uh, and left from San Francisco. Uh, uh, the, the situation at that time was very, very critical. Uh, uh, there were no troops in Australia uh, or New Zealand. They were all in North Africa and England, and uh, the countries were totally unprotected. They uh, shipped the 1st and 5th Regiments of the Marine Corps to uh, Wellington, New Zealand, and uh, before they could bring up our 7th Regiment, which was in Samoa, uh, they didn't have enough ships. Uh, They took us into Guadalcanal without our 7th Regiment. So we had the 1st 5th and 11th Regiment. Then they uh, gave us a regiment in reserve from uh, the uh, 2nd Division. I think it was the 6th Regiment. I think my uncle was in the 2nd Marine Division, 8th Regiment. 
Was yeah. he? Yeah, because yeah. I think he was in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. Well, that's where we were, but we were only there 10 days. We spent the whole 10 days uh, reloading the ships. They were not combat loaded. And we had 24-hour working parties just about. Uh, it was cold. It was sleeting. Uh, the uh, uh, supplies all fell apart. The boxes melted. Uh, it was it was really a miserable period. As, as a young man, did you not think about it too much? <laughs> Richard, as a young man, we were so stupid. We didn't know... <laughs> We didn't know what war was supposed to be like. We didn't know what the service was supposed to be like. We were uh, raw boots almost, you know. And so we just took it in stride. Was, was the whole series of events like a baptism by fire, literally? Absolutely. That's exactly right. When did you first see your first combat action? You know, people uh, uh, have different uh, ideas of combat uh, some people mean hand-to-hand fighting. Some people mean uh, being shot at. Some mean being in danger. After we got to Guadalcanal, we had air raids almost uh, three or four times a day. We had naval bombardments almost every night by cruisers and uh, uh, destroyers. One night they came in there with two battleships, and uh, I thought they were going to sink the island. They put. 1,100 rounds of 14-inch on top of us, and I didn't think anybody would survive that. So uh, all of that is combat. Uh, to me, combat is the first time you feel like, somebody's trying holy to moly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very low threshold for my definition of combat. <laughs> well, it, it began August the 7th and just about ended when they took us off of that miserable island. We hated that place. We nearly starved to death on it. Everybody had diarrhea and dysentery the whole time we were there. No toilet paper. That was the biggest problem. Wow. <laughs> it, you know, no one realizes the hardship of battle and, you know, just supplies. It's if just basic had, things. If they've had no military training, they really do not. People that have had military training understand, but uh, uh, they can't imagine standing in chow line on a troop ship for four hours to get two small boiled potatoes and a tablespoon of beans. They just can't imagine that. But that's the way it was. What, what was the most challenging part of your military experience? Was it spiritual in the sense that, you know, you're all alone out there without your family? Was it um, tactical in the sense that, you know, you're one guy and you're working with a whole group of people and relying upon a lot of people because... You know, in America, we always taught you know to be 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 yourself. You know, no, rely on nobody. You know, you're outlining it perfectly, and <laughs> I really never thought about it in trying to choose which one. It was all of those. It really was. It was all of those. Uh, you really did feel all alone at times. I think that that was very much in our thinking. Uh, we knew the U.S. was not yet heavily armed. We knew that uh, our Navy was. Uh, really not equal to the Japanese Navy. We knew they could not afford to lose those carriers. Uh, when, the, when the carriers pulled out, we didn't whine and cry. We knew that they could not uh, lose those carriers, that they had to keep those carriers. Uh, so it was all kind of wild. At that time, the Japanese and the Germans seemed to be invincible. Uh, the, uh, well, they had so much lead time. That's right. That's right. And, and the submarine navy was winning the battle of the Atlantic. Uh, it, it really lo- it was critical. We didn't know who was going to uh, uh, persevere and and come out on top. Uh, but uh, I think the good Lord was with us mostly. <laughs> now, was there at that time? Was there Marine Air? Oh yes, yes. The, As opposed to the Air Force. Uh, yes, there was. Uh huh. Of course, all Marine pilots had gone through. Pensacola Naval Training, so uh, uh, we, we really would think of Marine Air as Naval Air, uh, and it didn't matter. Uh, we were happy to have anybody there that could fly a pipe or cub <laughs> or anything. <laughs> what, was the, what was the level of coordination between the different services? Uh, I think it was excellent. I, I've always said I, I think it was excellent. I know uh, uh, a friend of mine one time, we went to a bar, and somebody asked him and said, uh, how did y'all feel about the Army? How did y'all feel about uh, 
uh, the Allied forces. And he told them, hell, he said, we'd have welcomed anybody. We'd have welcomed the little sisters of the poor if they'd have come in there with rifles and something. And, and a bayonet. And a bayonet. <laughs> so so uh, we, we were happy to see any uh, Allied forces that would arrive. Tell me about the whole Pacific campaign from your perspective. There's Guadalcanal, and then what, what transpired for you after that? Uh, that's a real difficult question because uh, uh, in the early part of the war, we were trying to stay alive. We were trying to survive. Uh, later in the war, it became astounding to watch the LSTs arrive by the hundreds, uh, to watch the uh, better equipment uh, uh, begin to arrive in quantity. Uh, but uh, the thing that remains in my mind is how close we were to having nothing at the beginning of the war. <laughs> Slingshots and Slingshots, <laughs> exactly and stuff. Now, what, 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 what did what, 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 what? Like you know, some people are gunners' mates, and some people are uh, you know are tactical officers or intelligence officers. What, what were you doing all this time? I was a PFC in the uh, eighty-one millimeter mortar platoon of of H Company. And uh, I was number one man uh, gunner in the squad. And we knew that weapon backwards and forwards. Uh, we knew everything about it. The Marine training was just vicious. It went on and on and on. I can still uh, tell you it was the 81 millimeter mortar. Smooth bore, muzzle loading, high angle type fire, hand fed battalion commander's weapon of opportunity. Consists of three main parts base plate, bipod, and tube. Base plate weighs 45 pounds, bipod weighs 46 and a half pounds, tube weighs 44 and a half pounds. Fires three types of ammunition HE light, HE medium, HE heavy. We had to practically memorize the manual. Right. And uh, we knew that uh, weapon, we knew we could put uh, an azimuth down, we knew we could zero out deflection, we knew we could do exactly what the OP. Uh, told us to do, and uh, Marines were trained that way. They could take a weapon apart in the dark. They could put it back in the door. dark, the rain, mud, everything. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think it was very vital. I think it saved us repeatedly. How many people comprised a mortar crew? A mortar crew was uh, was. It's, it's hard to say uh, because we had four uh, 81 mortars in the platoon. The platoon was about 65 men. You had uh, absolute uh, minimum of four to fire the mortar. But then on a landing, you had men that did nothing but carry ammunition. They would carry uh, clover leaves of ammunition. So as soon as you were set up in a defensive uh, uh, position, you had extra men. And they would come grab them for working parties. They would grab them for uh, other perimeter defense. We'd act as riflemen. We would act as uh, mortarmen. Uh, one day you would be uh, on a working party, the next day you'd be off, the next day on a working party, next day off. So a mortar platoon was very flexible. Rifle companies were not. They, they, they were much more rigid. And why is that? Because uh, they had a perimeter defense, and they needed every single man almost uh, on perimeter defense. So in terms of a sequence, would the, in terms of a landing, would the mortar people come in sort of later on? Correct. Yeah, we were in the second wave. Okay. Uh, is that because everything was so heavy and bulky? The, uh, at, at, at Guadalcanal, the first wave were rifle companies, and they had the old Higgins boats uh, with no front ramp. Uh, we had a few front ramp vessels at Guadalcanal, and uh, machine gun company and mortar platoons and all were in the, in the uh, front ramp uh, 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 vessels, and... Uh, it was uh, something that progressed. I mean, they, they did away with all the old Higgins boats, uh, and they all had the uh, ramps on the front. Now, after Guadalcanal, what, what was the next venue for you in the Pacific? After Guadalcanal, we were such a beat-up division. There was so much illness, malaria, uh, and uh, all that. They sent us to Melbourne, Australia, and uh, uh, we couldn't even climb the cargo nets to come aboard ship uh, when we left Guadalcanal. They had to almost haul us up with lines and we uh, spent nine months in Australia. Uh, we had uh, about 20 or 30 percent replacements uh, and uh, 
after uh, oh nine months, we left Australia. What was Australia like? Was it was it very rural? Uh, Australia uh, is a is a beautiful country, but most of the people in Australia live on long around the coast. The interior of Australia is a desert, and we were sent to Melbourne, which was a modern city of uh, two million people at least. So uh, we we loved Melbourne. We uh, uh, had bountiful beer and gorgeous food. Uh, they put our regiment in the Melbourne Cricket Ground, which was a stadium, and uh, that's where we actually stayed. So then after your time in Melbourne, where'd you go after that? They sent us north to uh, uh, New Guinea, and, uh, well, we went to Good Enough Island, which is an island off New Guinea, and trained there. And then we went to uh, uh, Cape Gloucester, New Britain. We made the landing at Cape Gloucester. And uh, it rained the entire time we were there. It was monsoon season. And then uh, after... uh, New Britain, we went to an island in the Russell Group called Pavugu, and I'd been overseas more than two years then, so they they started a rotation program, and I was eligible for rotation, but uh, we had a a drawing, a lottery, and uh, my name was drawn, and I got to come home. Uh, wow, that's a good lottery. <laughs> and I came home and... Uh, you usually get like just two bucks or a chance to get another ticket. <laughs> it was a great uh, event, but I did. I got to come home then. Uh, and, and how long were you home for? Uh, I was. Uh, we came home through San Diego, and uh, we were given a 30-day leave, and I was assigned to a uh, new base in uh it was actually Key West, Florida. It was called Boca Chica. It was about uh, seven miles north of Key West. And I was there for three months. Discovered on the bulletin board that they had a program called V-12. And uh, I applied for V-12 and uh, was accepted into uh, V-12. And spent the last uh, ten months of the war at Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina. In the V12 program. And what's a, oh, let me get to do a quick station ID. You're listening to Richard Solomon on Taking Care of Business on uh, WCWP 88.1 FM and probably on iTunes and a number of other places. Um, and I'm here with uh, Mr. Phillips, who uh, is a, a veteran of our country who has served honorably and with distinguished. And uh, he's telling us all about his, uh, his contribution to what makes us free today. So, okay, so you're in the V12 program in North Carolina. Uh, the war ended, the V-12 program was disbanded, and uh, I was discharged. So I spent four years and six days in the Marine Corps. Wow. So, but what was the V-12 program? What was it? It was actually an officer's uh, uh, training program. Okay. We would have graduated as second lieutenants uh, if the war had lasted another six weeks. We wow. almost got out. <laughs> so you would have gotten a better pension. <laughs> we would have gotten a better something or other. <laughs> So where were you on the news that the war had finally ended? What, where were you, and how did you find out? Because that had to be something. I was at the University of North Carolina, and uh, when it was announced, of course, uh, everybody uh, went wild. Uh, we built a gigantic bonfire in the middle of the street, Main Street there uh, in Chapel Hill, burned up the traffic light. The fire <laughs> company came and pumped water on the whole mess. The police came to restore order, and the guys picked them up, put them in their police car, and waved bye-bye to them. But it was quite a wild celebration. Wow. So then, okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. You happen to now be the author of a book. Uh, my, my, my boys, my two boys particularly, kept begging me to write down uh, some of my uh, stories. So... Uh, in 1997, I started. I'd write about an hour uh, at night. Uh, had a word process, and uh, I wouldn't write anything for two or three weeks, and then I'd write for an hour. But over a period of a year, I, I just wrote from memory. I did not use uh, any any source except my memory. Things that had happened to me, and uh, my wife was still alive at that time. And uh, I had 20 copies printed for my family. And uh, 
they were received with such enthusiasm that um, I had to do 20 more copies and making corrections and all for place names. I had a lot of Esperita Santos and things like that uh, misspelled, but um, finally I began to do, uh, get 100 printed at a time, and uh, now it has... So it was going to the printer. <laughs> now it has become a hardback, and uh, I tell people it's the best book since the Bible that I have proclaimed it that. There you go. Well, it probably is. <laughs> and and what what is the book... How, how has the book changed you? I don't think the book has changed me at all. I've, uh, I've just enjoyed uh, putting it all together and uh, putting what pictures I wanted into it. And uh, it's just been a fun project. Okay. And, and, and I see on the cover it talks about sort of the Pacific series on HBO. Could you talk a little bit about that? The uh, best friend of my whole life was a boy named Eugene Sledge. Eugene Sledge was from Mobile. Uh, I went into the Marine Corps before Eugene did, uh, and after the war, Eugene wrote a best-selling book that has been said to be the best war book ever written, and its entitled is With the Old Breed by Eugene Sledge, or With the Old Breed at Peleliu in Okinawa. And uh, Eugene died in the year 2001, and Ken Burns documentary uh, came to the Sledge family and uh, wanted to interview Eugene. When they found out he was dead, the Sledge family said, go see Sid Phillips. He was Eugene's closest friend. So they did, and uh, my uh, sister and I became involved in the uh, Ken Burns documentary. And then the Pacific, the... Uh, the miniseries. The, the miniseries. Uh, came to the Sledge family again uh, with the same uh, question and they referred them to me uh, and uh, so we were just caught up in it simply because we lived to an old, old age. So, See, you know, that's a, that's, that's a good thing, you know? Besides, somebody's got to tell the story. Why not you? Why not me? <laughs> 80, 85 years old and still going strong. Well, isn't it isn't it important for you to sp to tell the story on behalf of all those who are no longer able to tell it? Exactly. That's exactly right, Richard. Okay. 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 So anyway, I uh, really appreciate your time. Well, I didn't get a talk chance to talk to Catherine. No, no. So could you give us a minute? Because I see the, the handlers are pushing things along. They are. They set me off. So what, what was your involvement with all of this, you know, and how did it affect you and how does it affect you today? My involvement with the whole thing, of course, was I was a 17 to 22-year-old young girl in America, and I was in college when it happened. So I became involved when I finished college in the Red Cross, and I worked at the government nursery schools and spent a great deal of time writing to the boys in the service. That was a big job that the girls at home did. It meant morale, so morale, morale. Absolutely. It meant so much to them to receive a letter from home. In fact, in the miniseries The Pacific, Sidney reads a letter, and the boys say, "Who is the letter from?" And he says, "My sister." And they say, "Oh, you have a sister." <laughs> so. My, that's my one little appearance in the, oh, there you go. but um, we did that and we did everything we could to help promote our winning the wall you just have to read about it and realize that the women did the ship building they did the Rosie the Riveter Rosie the Riveter and that's what my nursery school was it was down by the docks in Mobile Alabama and Rosie the Riveter would bring her little, cute little child by, and we would take care of the children all day, and then she would come back worn out and tired and pick the children, pick the child up. But it was the first daycare. We had never had daycare in the United States till the government came up with these nursery schools, they called them. But it was basically daycare as we know it now. 
and we worked for the government. They paid us $125 a month, which was a huge amount of money. Even as a college graduate, I only made $95 teaching school. So I had a good job working for the government. Wow. And are you guys involved with Veterans Affairs or with Marine Corps alumni today? Uh, not very much, although Sidney is with the Marine Corps League. He does a lot with them. And we give talks to schools and groups like that. So. Okay. Well, I, I see that they're moving things along, but I would like to thank you both and all of that. Um, my roommate in military school, I went to Admiral Farragut Academy, was from Auburn, Alabama. So there you go. So, <laughs> so, so I got to give a shout out to Chris Hughes, uh, who was my roommate uh, all those years ago. I was at Auburn when Pearl Harbor occurred, and I walked into the dormitory about 1.30. I had just eaten lunch, and I walked into the dormitory, and there was all this crying and screaming. And I asked, what in the world has happened? And they said, go turn on the radio. So we ran up to our room and turned on the radio, and that's when we heard about Pearl Harbor. Wow. And after that, of course, being a group of women, there were much crying, and a lot of the girls went home. Uh, by the time I graduated, it had gone way down. My class of... Uh, graduating class was only down to 250 people, wow. girls. Most. Well, it was girls. All the boys had gone to war. Wow. All That's the right, yeah. volunteered and left. Wow. So. Well, we appreciate everyone's service, and I thank you for your time, and I wish you Semper Fi and all good things. Thank you so much. All right, this is Richard Solomon, uh, 88.1 FM, uh, tcbradio.com on WCWP. Uh, we'll take a break right after this. Thank you.